What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Thomas Deming, and he walks me through what it means to be digital between the physical and the digital, which does not mean hybrid. Are you intrigued? So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I am intrigued. <laughs> uh, why? Because you intrigued me with your recent workshop on the digital and the entire concept. And since then, I tried to wrap my head around. And today, I'm just intrigued to pick the expert's brain. <laughs> and before we're getting there, and before you can reply to the expert claim, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? I didn't call myself that, but I was called by, by clients, perhaps for 30 years ago when uh, I worked with them. Um, I moved from expressions. I worked with exhibitions and Swedish television, radio, and theater. But then I started to work with impression, how to get things to last after a session and activity. It was connected to that, uh, that some of my clients start to call me a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, uh, a person that makes things possible, smoother, and so I have no problem to call myself a facilitator. And what have you learned from your time at the radio and TV about group work, about the work you're doing today? Well, I, I actually, I started from cognition and how people think together. So um, you don't remember the main message from a PowerPoint presentation you see sometimes, but you know every line in a TV series or a TV show uh, with a story. Mm -hmm. And the people designing this story and the setting and the clothes and the director and so on, they are a team working together to design uh, circumstances and, and, uh, and processes that help people to think together, both in their own work. But you can see that people gather around TV series or movies and, and so on uh, worldwide, and they follow the characters and so on. So it's a lot of Uh, it's a lot of facilitation and, and to support the cognition processes mm -hmm. when people think together, I think. And I only assume that the, well, the biggest difference is clearly that TV and radio is, is a one-way communication. So you yeah. don't get the feedback from the group. You, you get it much slower. <laughs> mm. True. You have a gap in there. <laughs> yeah. And, and I see that a lot of companies and organizations during the pandemics use the old TV concept with a panel talking and talking and talking, but they try to get some interaction. And that was via writing something in a chat. And then the, mm -hmm. the host uh, actually shows what to, to get further from the audience and so on. But I have been very critical to that old TV concept, actually, during the whole pandemics. I, I think broadcasting first isn't what we need. We need interaction first, and then we can have some part of broadcast. So, But you get feedback from people when you do TV series and radio and, and so on. Actually, in radio, I was the, the uh, program boss, but also... Uh, Uh, the producer for a lot of programs at, at the local radio in Stockholm, and outside Stockholm, so tell you where I lived. And we had a lot of interaction, uh, and a lot of uh, programs where po people called in and, and have ideas, but also send reporters, flying reporters, as we call them, out in the uh, well society. And my uh, creativity uh, <laughs> was hard for my colleagues, perhaps, but I wanted my reporter that are going to a basketball match to be on the bench 
among the players, not sitting in, in a, a special studio at, at the arena. So, so already then I, I wanted to be so close to the reality where things happen. And I will want to move the workshops and the events into where things happen. And that's what, what this digital layer helps us with also. So um, I, I take a lot of things from my experience from radio and TV and exhibitions and, and so on. What just went through my mind is that even the inviting the audience to contribute. Mm -hmm. So what are the questions you ask to get someone who listens to the radio to fully engage, to grab the phone and to engage with the person in the studio. I think that's even one more layer as compared to a workshop where someone has already bought in and is part of a group sitting together to contribute. Well, the mistake is to, to, the mistake is to say, what do you think about this? Because then you get, we have a, a, on the Swedish nation radio, uh, a call P1, this is the name of the station, and you get all lunatics that don't know anything about the subjects. So it has been, a, a, well, a humor in itself. <laughs> But if you say, well, why is it better with black than white? And uh, you invite people knowing something about colors or the mm -hmm. context to call, then you get a lot of interesting uh, views and people engage. And what's happened uh, when social media come is that every, most radio stations and TV stations that, that go live also have a, a feed from Facebook and, and Instagram and so on. So, so you move between different uh, formats and you see short clips from the radio studio at Instagram and so on. Mm -hmm. so, so you start to have a multi format multi-channel uh, environment but i well it's 25 years ago i was a program manager on the radio station i, I tried to create that then already even though i don't didn't have so much technology helping me wonderful thank you for this little kind of deviation <laughs> fascinating i didn't know that about you and you have a company called range maker yeah And I was always uh, jokingly, when I refer or when I think of you, Thomas, also, we met uh, throughout Never Done Before and in the conversations that we have and the contributions you make, for me, you're the person who comes up with new names, yeah, new uh, concepts. <laughs> to... Yeah, I, I do. I, I um I'm very visual in my uh, facilitation style. I, I actually have Star Trek holodeck the old uh, science fiction series as my role model when, when i design my my workshop halls and, and uh, events but i use my language very much to try to picture new worlds and new realities and uh, it's most fun for me at least to take an old word or a combination of old word or namings and then people see a new world <laughs> and words, of course. And range maker comes from a deviation or, or a version of change maker from, from the beginning. I work with a lot of with change, but actually change isn't the value itself. Everyone wants to change, but no one wants to be changed. And in most co uh, companies and organizations, you have a continuous change instead of continuous improvements. <laughs> but what we case. need... Yeah, but what I think we need is more of a range. We need the, the capacity to think beyond what we already have. We need the capacity to get further with what we already have. And we need the capacity to last longer, the sustainability. And actually, we, me and my partner, Madeleine, We formed Range Maker before I got the book from David Epstein named Range. Mm -hmm. And what he grasped in that book is the, the real breakthroughs. If you see uh, the Nobel Prize and so on, the people that, that make them have range. They have done a lot of things when they were small. They, they have tested a lot of things from pure 
curiosity, they can often be very late bloomers. So they don't do a career as 20 years old and then they are CAO at 30 years old. In this book, he have, for instance, Van Gogh as an example, that he was so bad on painting. He was so bad on a lot of things, but he had an interest and could sit on a shore and look on the waves and see a little patterns on, on, um, in the water. And it was actually the two last years he find his way of painting. And nowadays they are the most valuable paintings we have. And he never uh, never benefited from this. No, he didn't. But but and they had a lousy life uh, in, in a lot of ways. But in the book you have other uh, example of people that actually get the benefits from it. Mm. I don't know the, the Japanese name of the guy that that. Um, Uh, invented Donkey Kong, this uh, handheld. Uh, he he uh, went by tube or train in, uh, well, in Tokyo area, I think. And he saw that grown up men sitting with their cell phones uh, and hiding them and doing something. And then he realized they are playing games, but they don't want to show uh, the rest of the society that they are playing because that's childish. And then he took a lot of old technologies and put them together in a touch screen and mm -hmm. did a lot of things. And actually it was a, a huge success. He's also the founder or, or the designer and uh, innovator about we, you know, this, when you st stand in front of, of your yes. screen and it reads your movements. Yeah. And, yeah. and he also took very old technology but put it together in new ways. And I, I realized that I am a range person. I always used old things in new ways. So my household god is MacGyver. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a sacred place at home with a photo of MacGyver where I sometimes <laughs> go and, and then beg wow. for, for uh, <laughs> power and, and ideas. Wonderful. So, so the name Range Maker comes from that. Fascinating. And I wonder, how would you facilitate then a range process as opposed to a change process? So what is the difference in terms of mindset or skill set that you bring in, but also that you help the group to grow? As I say to my partner, Madeleine, who is more about the inner development and I'm about adapting to the surrounding envir environment, the, the changes in, in the, the technology and so on. Uh, and uh, she says, you have uh, an ability to fool people up in the forest without they knowing that they actually are in a new environment. They just, whoa, 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 whoa. And then they stand on, on a, a mountain, metaphorically, and see a lot of things they haven't thought about before. And the way I do that is instead of just asking them, what do you think about this problem or what's the problem in our process? I bring up all from science reports to uh, creative angles via physical tools, thinking tools. I call them tangible thinking tools because you can grasp them and they are comprehensive. So I can take a research paper and transform it into six uh, coffee cups with clips and, and labels on them. So they actually drink coffee with six perspectives that are new for them. And then they get much more range in their thinking, their, their logical swear, <laughs> if I say so. Because yeah. one role model for me, uh, at least his work, is Edvard de Bono. And he, he, he has this uh, thinking tools like six thinking hats and so on. I have designed uh, six thinking funnels instead. Uh, I have funnels, you know, in, in the kitchen where you, mm -hmm. uh, put, you put them on the table or you can, instead of having them on your head. Your head. <laughs> yeah. But Edward de Bono, he, he had this idea that the perception control our ability to think very much and we are always logical but within our logical uh, perceptions where mm -hmm. so if you can widen your perception 
then you can enhance your ability to, to see and think things that you, you couldn't before. So, yeah. And I, what I hear is you also attach something tangible, as you say. So this also helps us to remember to attach some sort of emotion with it mm -hmm. because there's more than just one sense. Very much so. To it. Yeah. Which seems to bring us already right to the topic of today, to the <laughs> digital. <laughs> yeah. Which This is the new world, but it would, but I didn't invent it. It, uh, it was an Australian company in 2013, I think, that Ready. tried to find a, a naming for two si physical and digital side by side, which is hybrid for me. Mm -hmm. Digital is when they merge. Mm -hmm. So you can switch from a physical to a digital and back in just seamlessly. So if I understand it correctly, the hybrid is that some aspects are physical, other aspects are digital. And the way how we use the word hybrid, especially since the pandemic, is some participants are together in the physical world and some participants are remotely in the digital world. And that's then called hybrid. Whereas digital is me, myself, I am in the physical world by the things that I can touch that are around me, I can interact. And at the same time, me, myself, and I are in the digital world through the screen interacting with you. Yeah, exactly. And, and one part of it we call augmented reality. Mm -hmm. You can walk, you have this Pokemon Go trend. So you walk in, in your physical environment and you look through the screen of the, the smartphone and then you see a layer upon it. But in, in the digital, you can do the different way. You can be in a virtual world and then you see, you put a physical layer so you actually can look into a physical place, which we do when we have this uh, recording because I see you in your physical uh, world and you see me. And we are both in, in physical world, but... Uh, the digital is that w when I start to design thinking tools or uh, help people to think together and, and connect over geographical distance, we mix the, the information format in both mm -hmm. digital and physical. The thing is to do this with as simple means as possible, as MacGyver had solved it, not as Uh, virtual reality glasses, uh, it's uh, a long way. It's, it's not the shortest way to get the, the effect. Yeah. Can you give an example? Yeah. If I say we can make an ordinary printer, a 3D printer, if I send you a, a mail with a template that you print, and the template says, cut and fold this into a 3D dimensional figure. We call it origami. And I think it's a Japanese word. You can correct me on that. You, the people that know uh, Japanese. But then you have printed and folded a physical figure, perhaps six figures, and you in front of your camera are sorting them on the table with your hands. You, you are tactile. You are uh, move yourself. And I do the same here. Uh, and then you say, well, uh, can I borrow your arms? Because perhaps I have different factors or parameters on my figures than you have. So then I switch my camera, put it on, uh, if I have a smartphone, I can have it on my chest and the camera outside, and you see a first person view where I am in my physical area. So we are two minds sharing the same physical experience, but I am the arms. Mm. You have seen the surgeons operating through a robot on yeah. distance, but it could be a, a physical a person here doing things. So just by having physical aids on both sides and then use this digital interface to move into each other's physical worlds uh, is a part of the digital, a MacGyver style. You can do yeah. it much more advanced, of course. And a few things run through my head while I was listening to you. One is, it reminds me of something that um, Sean Blair was talking about when I interviewed him on Lego Serious Play and the online version of that, mm. that he said that as a Lego Serious Play facilitator, sometimes he's doing the magic hands, 
So mm. he's building what the groups are explaining. Yeah, that's digital from my point of view. Yeah. A simple deck of cards can be a brilliant way to engage a group. You can use them to stimulate thought, inject energy or spark lively conversations. But how can you use cards when you're facilitating virtually? Deckhive.com is a brand new platform that enables you to use cards on screen just as you would face to face. Invite people to a shared real time session and then let them select, move and flip cards over. Our growing library includes many popular card decks, including picture cards, strengths cards, emotion cards, and more. But if we don't have what you need, you can even create your own deck really easily. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK when you subscribe to a paid monthly plan, and you'll get the first month completely free. Go to deckhive.com and give it a try. And in this context, I can totally understand it, that it's just a matter of efficiency. So someone who's very good with legal, so he has the skills mm. that the group might not have. So it saves time. The other thing that came to my mind as an example was um, constellations, object constellations, that maybe if you have someone else on your behalf moving the objects, you get some emotional distance almost to the topic and you can see it from a distance yeah that, that's a good one but also that you cool brain i call it co-braining because you get in tandem two minds are together is standing side by side and both are moving objects with your hands or writing post-its or something then um, you have your own universe inside mm -hmm. and, then, and then you try to to meet in the physical but when you use another person's arms you actually connect in a very deep way that I haven't noticed before. So you both have the distance, the emotional distance, but you also have a Pacific Rim a movie uh, where they are standing two persons in large, huge robots fighting dinosaurs or, or something from another dimension. And you need to be two persons because otherwise you, your brain capacity doesn't work so the one in the head and the robot standing on the left are left hemisphere or right hemisphere it should be but i think they had the left hemisphere and so on and they are connected as two minds as two and they uh, in this movie they have to be siblings or something to, to have the dna you know tech stuff but what i have seen when working with this co-braining or tandem couples is that you actually get the synergy in the thinking that you don't get when we just talk to each other and move objects. And I wonder about different layers, maybe. One is, do you need to do some kind of thinking work beforehand to really get them there? Because I think it's not just like a button you can click and say, okay, now the two of you are synced and you're going to do this. It's I can imagine that it's almost meditative, but it's a... It's a tandem meditation almost. Yeah, uh, different couples need different time to think, of course. How do you help uh, them? Uh, easy task. Move this physical object on a scale from one to five. How good is X? And then they, they well, it's a three. Yeah, it's a three. And they start to think together. And then I, I increase the, the complexity in what we are doing. And... and I don't always uh, succeed, of course, but I, I'm looking for opposite pals, the opposite pole, uh, new world, or opposite pals. So if you have an impulsive person as hands and you have a thoughtful person as the back mind in, in this tandem, you get twice efficiency because uh, the impulsive try things with the hands and the, mm. the thoughtful, yes, waiting and waiting and then when the dust has <laughs> got down then it says let's move that thing to there and, and the impulsive said well good idea <laughs> so instead of all uh, all the time interact you can use your different preferences and different characteristics in the way you interact with your world and others yes. and that, what we're talking now is just a little part of this working digital yeah. you, you get a lot of new possibilities that you don't get from only digital or only physical. Just to close on this one, and then I don't want to hijack the digital as this tandem exercise, because one thought was, as you explained, 
I can perfectly imagine that someone that you would put two in tandem where one speaks to think and the other one thinks to speak. Mm, exactly. And one exactly. speeds the other up and slows the other down. Mm. And can you do it with more than two people? Would be one uh, question. And I haven't uh, would... managed to do it. Where one person can have two minds behind them. But uh, actually, we move all the time. So sometimes we are physical. In one person are the hands and, and legs and so on. And the other one or two are uh, virtually present. Mm -hmm. But then we move. You know, we are all in a physical setting yeah. <laughs> somewhere. And we use it when you come to a factory, for instance, and you have a line, you have some production problem, and then you have operated there at the line. He is the arms and, and so on. And then you have, uh, and perhaps it's Berlin, Tesla's new factory. I haven't built it yet. but And then you have experts or colleagues from uh, Singapore and from Buenos Aires beaming in And those three are looking at the physical line at their factory to find what's the problem and find new ways to solve the problem. And that's my best when you move the workshop to the reality. Actually, it is at the factory line where you have the problem. You don't sit in a conference facility and moving post is talking about how to improve your, your line. So... That's an even better ex example, I think, of these digital possibilities. Then it brings also the hybrid aspect, or what we call mm. hybrid, into the equation, right? Because mm. there you have the physical, the tangible physical, and people or participants to join remotely. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it's not clear what, what is remote from what. We say we work on a distance from what? Well, from our headquarters. <laughs> well, isn't uh, the center your customers where you add value for your customer or your citizen? When they are doing something, they're walking in the park and it's when they can walk in the park in a safe way, like the, the, the gardening and so on, then the value is created. Not two people sitting on, on chairs and talking about how to design the park. So, so the closer you can get the both value creation, the thinking and the problem solving and the learning to help the customer. So, so <laughs> the concept of remote or distance is a problem itself, I see, uh, from my point of view. Is it a problem because it doesn't define from what it is remote? I, I think it's cement. I don't know if that works in English. It's conserve old thinking patterns mm. of time and space. It's this industrial 19th century batch thinking of how to produce things that we see in, in the school system all over the world, that one same age in one room with one teacher, one subject and so on, and then you batch them through the, the system. And when we say you work on a distance, Often we mean from what was the temple or the center or, or something. But as I see it, we get more and more distributed in uh, time and space and in habits. Mm -hmm. in, also in habits, because if you have small child, you have, you have one world, one ordinary life. If you are a senior, you have another. So we have different uh, circumstances, but we are supposed to work together uh, and uh, our combined competence and ideas and so on, connections are supposed to, to be a synergy, not, not <laughs> uh, less than the parts together. So most of, of the thinking about uh, how to solve the problem with hybrid, remote, and so on, are, are built on, on old thinking patterns, I think. And that... I want to, to show the possibility of a better way to work that mm -hmm. um, take less resources, are more human friendly, that you use the variety between uh, both professions and personalities and so on. And now I'm running into a puzzle. So I, I do get that, especially with products being more and more digital. Mm. and no longer physical. So there is no clear center of attention from which we could be remote or not. Mm. 
And in a world where everything then is digital, what is the value and the benefit of inducing the digital or the physical into that? Because we're still all so physical. So everything isn't digital, even though metaverse is a try. They, they try, I say they, because I haven't <laughs> worked with that word. I try to, to des describe the second generation of internet, the seamless mm -hmm. um, 3D interactable spaces. Where you emerge. Yeah, exactly. Into uh, the world. Yeah, exactly. But uh, my neighbor, my closest neighbor, uh, other side of the corridor where we live, uh, well, never mind how we live, but she is 93 years old and she has people coming home to her every day, morning, midday, uh, so on, helping her. And they have 80 minutes to do all the things because they do, and then they move further. And sometimes they bring new people to, to do this service. And then in the digital world, they have tandem with the experienced one that's sitting on their shoulder and helping them, introducing them for this Brit, her name is, and make things more smoothly because we are, we have a lot of, of um, professions that are social uh, in a physical context. We still have uh, doctors, uh, a lot of teachers, even though, but also in those uh, taking care businesses yes and i think in a digital way to work of course i am in a distance from brit if i sit well in malmö southern part of uh, sweden and uh, facilitating a newcomer to help brit uh, walking into her apartment but i think the center moves all the time the physical center moves all the time and this would also take the best advantage of different talents. Very so, much so the individuals who are just better with physical proximity and the social part and others know how to do things so they can be remote from the center of attention, who is the client in this case. Exactly, exactly. And this isn't a new thing. I, I, in Barcelona, I know for many years, at least 15 years, they have put together 50 talent and doctors uh, looking at cancer uh, when you have x-ray and so they are very good to look on, on the plates mm -hmm. to see cancer and some of the people there are very good at soft issue uh, and others on, on the skeleton and so on so they have a brain hive in barcelona and they could already for 10 years ago remote control microscopes and in a whole of the world And also now I know next step is to do surgery, surgery with uh, robots mm -hmm. and so on. So it, it isn't a new thing, but we don't use it in, in uh, retail and, and uh, education and... Uh, uh, Facilitation. No, exactly. So therefore I, I try to find words and, and actually it comes also from Star Trek, this beam in or beam me up, Scott, they are. Mm -hmm. but they, but The easiest MacGyver way to beam someone in is if I am a Swedish in Stockholm's archipelago on an island and I have a management team working on a, a subject, we are sitting at a campfire and then I beam in an expert from Berlin on an iPad and the expert has his or hers face close to their, their camera where they are. So we see the face in natural size. Almost. Mm -hmm. And then I put it on a stand at the campfire and perhaps enhance the sound a little bit. Then we have beamed in a person, an expert that just come for 30 minutes and help us to see things that we didn't get more range, mm -hmm. get even more range. Instead of taking this person, in the worst case, by flight and all of this emission to move them to Stockholm and then a boat out to the island and so on. So, uh, so this beaming is, is a very good way to, to enhance every group, I think. Which is then already back to the hybrid, right? Yeah. And I wonder, what is it that the concept of digital didn't become a buzzword? is hybrid did. So what are maybe 
the audience, what are they overestimating hybrid or underestimating digital? Look, I think the easiest uh, reason is pronunciation. <laughs> hybrid is easier to say and spell because you don't know fidget. How do you spell that? And then it is the next dimension that most haven't thought about yet. So hybrid is easy. I had a hybrid car for 15 mm -hmm. years ago, uh, um, a Prius. So hybrid means just mix up. <laughs> And usually so it's all... the worst of both worlds. Uh, yeah, it, very <laughs> often it is like that, exactly. But I think Julie Sweet, that are the CEO of Accenture, 629,000 employees, I think, worldwide. And they have employed 54,000 persons just the la last quarter. And she said that we are starting to using the word digital. And we want to emphasize uh, or, or put forward the idea that places and spaces isn't as important. It's the interaction between uh, individuals mm -hmm. or teams. They bought 60,000 Oculus Quest VR kits. And uh, they also designed welcome to the company boxes that they physically send out. Because otherwise, when you change from another firm, you just get a new computer, but it looks the same. But when you don't have an office, they send things that you can put up. So it looked like a physical office, even though it was at their home office or at the close uh, co-working space. So when Accenture start to do things, it, it, it tend to spread. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that the reason why digital have, haven't spread and the hybrid is spread is that it's a word you always can say, even though you don't understand the thing mm. about what you're talking about. Well, it's hybrid. And so many experts have suddenly emerged that have webinars and seminars and education on how to lead in a hybrid environment. <laughs> no, I don't think they know what they talk about, actually. <laughs> well, they know what they talk about, but they are still in the old way of thinking, I think. Mm. And Yeah, and I think what is fascinating, and maybe the fidgeter is just the next step, once we know that we can create the best of both worlds in the mm. hybrid via the fidgeter, so still bringing the physical and the, um, the physical experience to the individual. Because one idea that came up in the workshop that um, you hosted, and I found that fascinating, was how to beam someone over or how to transform reality um, into something that is more approachable. So we're thinking of a huge event and I just came back from the, from the expo and it's very difficult if there's something happening on one end of the area and five minutes later, I want to be at the other end. It's impossible because I cannot beam myself over. No. But then there maybe is an experience where I want to be physically there because it involves touch and smell and others where I can actually join digitally mm. so, through the screen. And if I um, understood you correctly, this would be an example then of a digital implementation of an event where I can basically experience some parts and then beam myself over to digitally expect others. Yeah, I have a role for helping you be also move when when you beam in. I call it humatar, a human avatar. <laughs> humatar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, so I think most expos and fairs and so should have a, a squad of humatars for the people don't not even entering the city where the fair are and they could have one or two or more people behind them walking uh, by the stands and then they put some cameras on this keynote and, and, and then they edit the best of highlights from the day and then they have a studio talk as you have in sport when they sit and analyze the matches and then the skiing and so on but uh, you actually got the new dimension i haven't thought about You could have Yumatars, even though you are on the same expo, but yes. you want to be on that. It could be one kilometers away. <laughs> exactly. 
And then that's what I call digital twins instead of digital twins, because you could put the layer upon the expo where you have a virtual world. It could use what we use, Velo, for instance, mm -hmm. in a simple way that actually look like the, the uh, expo. Yeah. yeah. And then you could... If you uh, go in on your laptop or, or Velo, I think they come with a with, uh, smartphone mm. interface, uh, then you actually just click on, on uh, where you want to be. And there you have on the wall a uh, resource streaming from that, but also a chat or something that you can ask questions. Yeah. Uh, so I can so interact with the people who are there in real time, but mm. I could also walk there. Yeah. What is the difference between a digital twin and a Yumata? Ah, uh, a digital twin is, is a description using in the industry where you do a CAD drawing uh, and then connect the CAD drawing to the physical space. It could be a line, production line. And when you change the CAD drawing, you change the robot movement, perhaps when you assemble things and so. So digital twin is often referred to, I put on LinkedIn, I saw they have an autonomous car taking photos, uh, millions of photos on San Francisco, going up, down, and so on. And then from the 2D photos, an AI transfer it into a 3D world. And then you have a digital twin of San Francisco. Of the where city, you can and move. then you can... Ah. Ah, you can move in it. But the digital twin is both ways. It's, you can have a virtual world, and then you have not perhaps a replica, but you have things that re reminds you of the virtual world in the physical world. And that's what, what I talked about, this origami. I, I take a, a, a virtual thing, a, a word or a PowerPoint document. I have done some um, shapes on it. And then you print it on your side. You, you, you are in, in another city, in another country. And actually, I just send. And then you do a physical copy of the digital thing. And then you take a photo of your physical, uh, load it up on a Padlet or a Myra board. And then we uh, do things there. And then we do a new drawing that you print. Or perhaps you project a picture of what we have refined in the virtual space on your wall where you are, or on the floor where you're standing if you have your projector on the front. So you, in, in a digital twin, you move between the formats all the time. Sometimes you just do it to show off, but very often you have use of it. I was, I was just <laughs> about to ask the question, what is then too much? Because you can get lost in translation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I lost say, between or, the worlds. Uh, and especially I, when you're in charge of a group, you want to make the process easier. Yeah, uh, but when I train the group and train my co-facilitator or perhaps I, I'm a co-explorer, I, I, I don't have an ans all answers and then train people, but uh, then we need to get some range of the possibilities and then we back and just use as little as possible. Mm. So I, I love this simple solutions, not this uh, overcomplicated. But when I talk now, I, I just want to help you, but also the people that listen to see the possibilities. The entire way. <laughs> And another use case just popped up in my mind is the prototyping phase. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine a group producing together the idea of a prototype. And then as you explained it, okay, send it to the printer, print it out and produce it in your own home and then interact with it in the physical space with the prototype mm. to then provide feedback on how it feels in the different phases. Yeah, and um, I have learned in design thinking that, that have this user-centered uh, process that in the prototype phase, actually, you can have three phases. You have mm -hmm. the pretend five, uh, the prototype, pretend mm -hmm. type, the prototype, where you have different functions, and then comes the prototype. And this pretend prototype is the volume of a product or a service, or, or it could be a digital interface, even though you make a physical print of it. Mm -hmm. And you have the little uh, icons on the screen, but they are like uh, separate objects where you mm -hmm. can move. And then you take a photo and send back to the uh, UX designer. <laughs> so you're so right. The, the more abstract and the more not ready yet, 
you talk about or work with, the more use you have of this way of working, I think. Yes. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.